Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Fred uh, North. I'm a, what you call an aerial coordinator working for the Hollywood industry, and I'm going to go more into details. Fred, what's going on? Welcome to the Pilot to Pilot podcast. Thank you so much. Pilot to Pilot. I love that. Are you a pilot, <laughs> by the way? Yeah. Yeah, I'm a corporate pilot. So I fly okay, citation exactly. latitude. I got, I just actually looked at my logbook the other day. I have like 5,700 hours, I think. That's so pretty good. A little bit of flying. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. good. But uh, we'll, we'll there. talk a little bit about What do you yeah. say? You're getting there. <laughs> getting there. Yeah. How many hours do you have? Uh, just a little bit over 21,000. Oh, dang. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. How many do you yeah. have when you're 33? That's a better question. You know, did you get my book? Uh, no, they never sent me your book. Well, you need to get one because right, in, we'll the, in the book, the, re- the, w- the reason I'm saying that is because uh, I use my 13 notebooks that I have because I have yeah. the book. And it, at the beginning of each chapter, there's the flying hours. So if you read the book, you're going to know how many hours I had at 33. Um, that's awesome. That's actually really smart. I like that idea. I'm if I ever write a book, I'm going to steal that. Yeah. The, the <laughs> book is really fun. Um, cool. It's a crazy journey and um, it's called Flying Sideways. And it's, it's, it's a fun book. And at the end of the book, you have some QR codes and you can use your phone and the story that I'm telling, then you can put your phone and then watch the video of what I'm writing. Love it. Yeah. All right. After this, I'll buy the book. You got to get it. So Some we'll, we'll crazy make it happen. helicopter story, but there's also plane stuff. There's, Perfect. It's, we'll it's, make fun. It it's fun. It's fun. Well, cool. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Let's dig in. First question I ask everyone is uh, why aviation? Was there just an initial longing, looking up, seeing airplanes? It's like, dang, Fred wants to do that. Or was it just kind of a spur of the moment? I'm going to go fly. So uh, my, my parents are teachers, were teachers, so absolutely not, you know, French teachers. And uh, I'm born and raised in Africa, so uh, no helicopters, no aviation, not close to an airport. Nothing in my family was uh, aviation. But yeah. when I was eight years old, um, I, was on, uh, I was living in, in West uh, Africa, in Senegal, and then I was in the street, I'm eight years old. And there's a helicopter that flew above my, uh, my house, and then he landed in the soccer field that is close to us. And it's a soccer field that was no grass. Uh, it was a sandy soccer field. So when, when mm. he landed and I was there, the sun, the, 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 the wind, the noise, the electrifying moment, basically is like, whoa. It, it, to me, uh, as an eight years old living in Africa, it was like an alien ship because <laughs> there was no cell phone. There was no TV. You have to understand that it, you know, uh, from my perspective at the time, it's like, this is a vessel. Like this is an alien yeah. ship. And the helicopter landed, there were no doors, and it was like a five-seaters. And then the guy that got out of it was my teacher of like social study or something like that at the time. No way. And then he, he had cameras uh, around his, his neck like that. And then, sorry. And then he, he was going to do some uh, pictures of uh, uh, the main uh, river that was bursting into the ocean. So then he said, do you want to come with me? And you have to understand that this is in 1969. Okay. Oh, wow. So there was no doors and no seat belts. I'm eight years old. He's putting me in the back. There's three seats in the back. No doors, no seat belts. Who gives a shit at the time? He put the guy, me, eight years old, by myself in the back with no doors and no seat belts. And I'm holding the seats <laughs> and then we go for a flight. And then when they do turns, I'm thinking I'm going to fall. You know, you're eight years old. So I'm holding like a crazy guy. And anyway, I do that flying and then I land everything. So that stayed like I was like sold on it. So that was my first interaction. Um, and then you have to go fast forward all the way when I'm uh, 20 years old, I'm in the army in France and then I work with helicopter and then everything came back to my mind. And then that's when I decided to be a pilot. You know. When you um, when you had that first interaction, was there any kind of, you mentioned later, it took a little bit of time before you realized that you wanted to be a pilot. So when you went in the helicopter the first time you got out, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to go fly that. It was That was really cool. That'll probably never happen again. Was that kind of your mindset? Well, the first time I was eight years old. So, you know, you don't yeah. even ask yourself those questions. It was like I was in, in, in an alien vessel. Like to me, and also you have to understand that that helicopter was an Alouette two. I don't know. It's like a, it's like a Mad Max helicopter. Yeah. Um, so it was not, it was not like a fancy Augusta, you know, it was not a fancy VIP machine. It was like a rough Mad Max machine, which added to the emotion that I had that day. 
but it was it was very deep in my mind. My my mother told me I was drawing helicopters all the time, so it was there. Mm-hmm. But it was not like uh, I didn't think about it. It was just there. And then when I went to the army and I had to do some rescue stuff, I was on the ground, but I had to work and interact with helicopters. That's when I said, this is what I want to do, you know, to be yeah. a helicopter pilot. So what was eight-year-old Fred North's dream kind of when you're playing on a soccer field? Was it to keep playing soccer? Uh, did you have any other kind of dreams or goals that you had in your mind then? I mean, I know an eight-year-old, how many dreams and goals do you actually have? Other yeah, like I mean, astronauts, I wanted, stuff like that? because my parents were teachers, I wanted to be a gym uh, teacher for a long time. And yeah. then they told me there's no really a future in those, all those things. <laughs> and then uh, rapidly, I wanted to be a, a stunt in the movies, you know, uh, nothing to do with the flying part. And mm-hmm. then when I went to the army and I worked with helicopter, that's what I said, you know, I really want to be a helicopter pilot. He was not, at the time, he was not aviation. It was the helicopter part of it that was interesting. Me. Yeah. What it's, was uh, what was the timeline for you or kind of the reason behind going into the army? Was it mandatory? Was it something you always wanted to do? Talk a little bit about that. So my parents, so I was very bad at school. So I didn't <laughs> go to college. I was shit at school. Like, like you can't even think of. It was not my thing. Okay. Um, so they didn't know what to do with me. And you have to understand my parents were more academic. They were like teachers and smart mm-hmm. teachers. So I was like a loser, you know, they didn't want to do with me. So they said, you got to go to the army. So I, I signed a contract for five years with the French army. And, but before I go there and I, all I'm telling you here, it's in the book, but it's in a funny way. I'm, I'm telling all those <laughs> stories before going to the French army. I tried to be a jet fighter pilot and I went to do one week of a selection. So it, uh, I'm sure it's the same in the US where you can go and to see if you can be a candidate for, to be a potential jet fighter pilot. So I went mm-hmm. to a, a, a place south of Paris one week and for one week they do f- a lot of testing to be a jet fighter pilot. So after the five days, so that was that's with the French Air Force. So I do the yeah. five days. After the five days, to me, the way I saw it, I was 18, okay? I thought I'm gonna be the best motherfucker jet fighter pilot ever. Like I thought all the testing were fantastic. I was feeling good yeah. with myself, you know. Then I go to the front of that guy. Uh, he's like a, it's like a general, like a, like a high rank. And he was the one to make decision on who will be admitted to the program. <laughs> and then that, it was a Friday, like 5 PM. I remember all my life. That guy is facing me. You have to understand he's representing like a huge, you know, weight for me because yeah. he is the one saying if you're going to be a jet fighter pilot or not. And then he said, you know, Fred, I wanted to tell you. And when he said that, I thought he was going to say you were the best of the school, you know, all that <laughs> stuff. And he said, you will <laughs> never be a good pilot. You will Dang. never be a pilot. You should not even think about it and go do something else. So that was harsh, like, like a, a slap in the face. Like you can't even imagine you 18. And then that guy says that, okay. And it, it took me like a month or two to recover from that because I was so depressed and I thought that was it. I'm done. Yeah. What I did not understand at the time is he was telling me no. He was not saying, in fact, he, he told me I will not, never be a good pilot, but he said in, he wanted to mean is you will never be a good military jet fighter pilot. But he never said that. So. I understand now at my age and with my experience, I know when somebody says no to you, he never says no for you. He say no for him. Yeah. Okay. So you have to make sure that you don't take that as a no necessarily because he doesn't know my life. He didn't know really why I'm he, he, that, that guy was the first time I met. Okay. He would just right. took a bunch of uh, testing and then, uh, and my, my main issues was uh, lack of uh, discipline. Like I didn't really like somebody tell me what to do and something stupid. Yep. So all the testing that I did with their military shrink didn't go well. But I, <laughs> I, I so he basically, that's why he said that, but I took it personally as a pilot. So look, I'm just saying for the audience, it's not because somebody says no to you that he says no because of you, he's saying that because of them. So don't take it the wrong way because it took me a while. So after that event, and when I, I went to the army, but the, 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 the French uh, army, not the air force, and then when I had the connection with the helicopter, that's when I, I, I became a deserter, deserter in, you're saying, mm-hmm. okay, because I left the army because I was not supposed yeah. to, I signed a five-year contract. 
So in the so book, I mean, I'm, like, I'm explaining yeah. the whole thing, how you, they put me in prison, they do all that stuff. And at the Dang. end, they signed my release. But it, it took a little while. Uh, I, was a, I was a wild cat because I wanted to, now I wanted to do the helicopter pilot lesson and stuff. And then I did that. And then it was complicated to do my license. But um, that's how it, you know, it played. What was the reason for, uh, for wanting to get out of the military? Was it, has it have to go back to you not liking, liking people to tell you what to do? Or was it kind of that? Well, the it, that, that was that. But it was not just that. Yeah. It, it, because I was, the problem in, the, in, in, in France back then, and maybe it's the same in the US, but if you sign a contract with the, with the army, you, you have to stay where you are. You can't change from the army to the air force or to the Navy. You yep. stop where you are. And yep. when I asked them, can I go to the helicopter, uh, army division? They said, no, you are, uh, I was doing, uh, I was mountains and rescue uh, team. Yeah. Uh, because I was a good skiers and I love the mountains and climbing all that stuff. So I was in uh, Chamonix, which is in France, uh, uh, mountains, one of the highest peak in Europe. And, um, so anyway, they said no. So because they said no, I figured I have to get out of the army and then do it in the civilian uh, world. That's why. <laughs> so how'd you get out? I mean, I know you said you deserted, but like, what did you do? Did you just run away? Did you uh, like in the middle of the night? Just... I went to New York on vacation to okay. see my girlfriend and I stayed there. You know, I was supposed to be gone for one week and I stayed for like two months. And then when I came back, the problem is I came back the wrong way. So instead to come this quickly, you know, and, and they would have got me, but I mean, instead to... I, I didn't do it, the, 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 you know, you should read the book because I explaining how I did it. But lo long story yeah. short, I came with, because I came from New York as a French guy, I came with all the cliche, the American cliche that you can have as a French person looking at yeah. America. Back then, uh, you have to understand that's in the 80s and stuff. <laughs> and I came back with rollerblades, uh, had a yellow Sony, you know, the, the, the speakers, the two speakers, uh, handheld yeah. thing, the yellow one, the Sony that was super famous back in the days. So I had it on my shoulder with my backpack and I was rolling and I went inside the, the base. The problem was it was 8 a.m. in the morning and there were all the soldiers, you know, doing a flag thing where you do the oh. salute, the flag in the morning. So when I yeah. came like that, that didn't go well. So they put me <laughs> in prison directly. I even didn't go to my room. So oh anyway. my God. did you ever think about to stay in the United States? Just be like, ah, oh, let's stay here as long as I can. No, I, then I, I, I can't arrest me here. I, 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 w I wanted to do that, but I didn't have a visa. Um, uh -huh. it was, my English was like, like, like your Chinese, maybe like really <laughs> very good. sucks. Yeah. No good. Yeah. So I got Nihao and Shay Shay. Right. But it. it was uh, about good morning and have a nice day. You know, that's it. So yeah. it was, you know, of course I could have, but I was not mentally, I didn't have money. It was like, uh, mm -hmm. You know, so no. So then I, ha I had to leave the army and then do it in France and then, you know, did some crazy work job to find the money yeah. to do my lessons. So, all right, you are, uh, you officially, well, we'll say you clear your name. You des you deserted the army. You're, you're doing your own thing now. Yeah. Helicopters was all that was on your mind, right? Like it was yeah. like, I want to fly helicopters. That's all I want to do. Yeah. So did you stay in France to do that? Did you yes. come back to the States? Okay, so you stayed in France to do stay that. Stay in France to do that. You had, yeah. You mentioned you had no money. So what did you do for money? Did you uh, so, just work all the jobs you could? So my girlfriend <laughs> gave me a little bit of money. My okay. parents gave me a little bit. So my girlfriend gave me the most. My parents gave mm -hmm. me what they gave to the other, my, my siblings, because I have a twin sister, another uh, sh a smaller brother and, a, and a, a bigger sister. So they gave me, you know, like... Uh, the equivalent of $5,000 basically at the time. Okay. And then my girlfriend gave me like 30,000. That was the biggest chunk. And with that money, oh, wow. I bought a uh, used a uh, car that, that had like a little, little damage from insurance company and, and old garage, like shop. And I fixed the cars and then I sold them with a profit. And I did that for like eight months. And then nice. with the $35,000, I made it to 60,000. And then I had nice. enough money to pay for my uh, lesson because I didn't want to stop in, in the middle and mm -hmm. not be able to keep going. So I went to the, there was a heliport in Paris and I went to the, that company called Heli France. And at the time there were the helicopter company in Paris and they had a shuttle that was going from like, like if you're in LA, LAX to the city or like JFK mm -hmm. to New York. So they had that in Paris. Yeah. And I told the, the, the CEO of that company, I said, I will do anything to be able to uh, learn in your company, to be a pilot in, you know, in your company. Yeah. He told me, but you don't even exist. Like you don't, I, I don't hire pilots unless you're 2000 hours. 
I said, oh. I'll, I'll do anything. So then he said, okay, you can work for, you know, as a ground crew at the local airport. And if you want, you can come back every day, do six minutes of flying each time. So I'm not going to pay you, but you can do six minutes. Very generous. So then I worked 10 hours a day. I was doing six minutes in the morning and six minutes at the end of the day in the helicopter flying with the guy. And I was telling people where to go to the bathroom. I was carrying the luggage. I was uh, driving the van. So I did that for six months. And they saw that I was really a hard worker person. Then they said, okay, we can, we can teach you. So that they, they, so I basically, they, they were, they didn't have a school. So they bought a helicopter for the school. They started a program oh, wow. with me basically because they were only doing VIP charters and stuff like that. Yeah. So they bought a, a crappy Anstrom helicopter, like a small one that was really not easy to fly. So I started with them. I did my commercial license with them. And then the CEO told me, Fred, uh, now get out. I said, but you told me I can, I can fly with you. But he said, you have 150 hours. You need to have like uh, at least a thousand hours to come back to me. I was devastated because in my mind, I was going to go, you know, the stupid dream thinking is going to work out. So then yeah. I had to work for other company, like shitty company, like crappy helicopters. I had engine failures, gearbox failures, plenty stuff. Yeah. But I built up my hours. And then after I had 1,000 hours to the dot, I came back to that guy and I said, that's it. Now you hire me. And then he said, well, <laughs> you need a bit more hours. I said, no, you promised me. So then he hired me and then I worked with them for a couple of years and then I kept you know, yeah. flying with other people. Um, when you finally got the job, was it kind of a big sigh of relief where you're like, man, I finally made it. This is my job. I did it. No, I mean, it was amazing. I mean, you know, for the, the first, yeah. first, the first solo flight, it's like, it's like, if I'm telling you, you're going to go to the shuttle uh, to go to space tomorrow. I mean, for me, it was everything. Yeah. My first job, I was flying in a Bell 47. So the bubble um, like a yeah. really piston helicopter, they were paying me $1,000 a month. But I, I, I was so happy. Like, I don't give a shit about the money. You know, he, he, the guy was abusing, you know, me, uh, I mean, as far as For the sure. salary. But I was so happy I didn't give a crap. I was the most happy, like the happiest guy in, in the world. So it was fantastic. Yeah, super happy. When, um, when someone gives you money, especially like a large chunk of change, do you feel kind of like forever indebted to them? Like in the back of your mind was, did that help push you to continue your training, continue down this path? Um, even still today, do you still like think about that and then how thankful you are for, for receiving, you know, the equivalent of 30 grand. That's, that's a lot of money. Um, no, but I have, how did that kind I, of play in your mentality? No, I gave back all the money. I mean, not, yeah. I mean, to my parents, no, because my parents, but my girlfriend, yes. <laughs> I mean, in fact, because we, we got married and then we divorced later because she slept with my yeah. best friend. Um, you know, <laughs> Uh, she took way more than she gave me. To, uh, trust me. Okay. So th th that was all good <laughs> so, there. So there was no problem there. Even. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, because she also did that with my best friend in my bed. So she took my bed, my house, my thing. So, yeah, but anyway, forget that little piece. And in the yeah. in the book also, I'm I'm, I'm 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 saying a lot of that stuff. But anyway, it's more funny than anything else. But <laughs> no, I didn't. Uh, I don't like to owe money to anyone. So yeah, I'm not a okay, kind of man. person that. Um, if for a reason I borrow, which I never do, but, uh, you know, for anything, then I'll make it up to you a uh, 1000%, you know? Yeah. 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 It's a, uh, it's tough getting the money. I mean, that's been one of the biggest kind of cost entry, right? right. Is, uh, or prohibits people getting in is the money and you have to essentially, there's multiple ways to do it, whether it's loans, whether you're lucky enough to have someone lend you the money, uh, a family member or a girlfriend. Yeah, you have be. to find a way, but to me, yeah. each time I, I hear, hear people saying, you know, money is an issue, I said, you should not see it as an issue. Okay? It's a way for you to go to get things. So try to make the effort to get that way. You know, because it, when you say money, often it's like, oh, you know, I need the money for this and money for that. But if it's not your license, it's going to be a house. It's going to be a car. It's going to, it's, it's an, it's a, a, a mean to get something. And it's going to be there all your life anyway. I want a bigger yeah. helicopter. I need this. I need to go business class ticket somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's always the money part, but it, you'll find a way, you know, we all do. Yeah. And, you know, and one thing to think about it too, is this is kind of like an investment, right? You're investing in yourself. Yeah. It's education. Yeah. It's, it's a way for you to make money down the line. So yeah. whether you're sacrificing right now, uh, taking out a loan and, or, or getting the money and working two jobs, it's, right. it's a temporary suck yeah. for you to do what you want to do eventually and make, I mean, you always, yes, you, money, you so. need a bit of pain 
yeah. to anyway to get what you want and exactly. be happy about it. I mean, if there's no pain, I mean, a little bit of difficulties, there's no achievement. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's hard to have a lot of joy in your career when you haven't had to earn it. Right. <laughs> you you right. got to roll up your sleeves eventually. But you you got to get arrested in a French prison eventually. Right. Uh, <laughs> in aviation though, we, we do, everybody goes through that same, you know, yeah. complication at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about your first couple jobs and you're talking about engine failures, gearbox failures. I had an engine failure in a 206 when I was doing aerial photography uh, in a Cessna 206. Um, and it was, I mean, yeah, it's just, it sucks, right? It, it's kind of part of building your hours, or at least it was part of building your hours until now where you can have 1,500 hours, get hired at an airline, fly like a 777, which is crazy yeah. uh, to, to you, to me. But building your hours used to be like a life or death thing. Like, I mean, I mean, it's kind of exaggeration, but <laughs> some of these planes you never knew if it was, <laughs> what was going to happen after you took off. 1,000%. Uh, so talk little, yeah. yeah. So talk a little bit about kind of the mentality of building your hours, especially coming from an engine failure, uh, rewind your brain, be like, all right, this is not going to happen again. And then you have another one. And then kind of talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, for sure, when you're a young pilot and then you, 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 you like, I mean, you like a whore. You're ready to go with anyone. Uh, yeah. It doesn't matter uh, who that is. You're going to go with whatever's presenting to you. So that Bell 47 that I was flying, he was a wreck. The guy that was owning that machine, he, he did, he, he, uh, on the dashboard, there's those little warning light, you know, uh, caution lights. So he, yeah. he unscrewed them and he removed the bulb and he put them back. Oh. <laughs> now, my mistake, I was not checking them one by one when I'm supposed to, to check if they're working. Yeah. Um, but when I had the engine failure, the light never, never came on because, uh, there was no fucking bulb in there. So just to tell you the, the, the guy, how he was. So uh, there was no maintenance on the machine. So that's why I had problems on, on that machine, like crazy, <laughs> but it didn't matter at the time because it was such a happiness, you know, to fly that machine and the Dell 47, if you see what it is, that bubble with the, the tail that is, you know, like tubes in the back. Mm -hmm. um, it's a Mad Max machine. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it, you connect with that machine because it's, it's a man's machine. Like there's oil everywhere, you know, uh, it looks like a, like a, like a bee, you know, it's uh, <laughs> so when I had the failure, it, it never, I mean, I, I, I managed the failure. I landed safely and I had passenger with me. Um, I was doing tours and the guy that was with me, in fact, had no legs. He was a handicapped guy that was, we put in the machine. Oh, wow. And then his daughter was with him and he had a tractor accident five years before going with me. And when the engine stopped and then I started to do my auto rotation, he gave me a, a big thing like that and say, oh, don't, don't worry, kid, you know, um, it'll be fine. And, and I said, uh, yeah, of course, but he had so much confidence because of, I guess, what he, he, his experience was. Yeah. But then I landed in that muddy field, straight and level, no problem, no damage to the chopper. It was more like the six hours to, to try to find somebody to get my, my guy that could not walk. That was more yeah. the issue and everything else. But when I got the gearbox failure, to me, I knew I had all those issues because the machine were not maintained properly. I had full right. um, confidence that a, a, a proper maintenance helicopter would be fine. But that's when I learned that if I, I need to know my emergency procedures and all the you know training had to be done properly because each time I was able to manage the emergency because I was properly trained for it. So I was yeah. just thinking I need to be on top of my game, you know. Absolutely. And then you, uh, you work in these jobs, you come back, you go, Hey, I got a thousand hours. You essentially forced the guy to hire you, <laughs> which you did. Yeah. Um, how long you said you were there for five years. Yeah. I, mean, only less there, that. I was, uh, okay. uh, maybe three years there. And then I, I went to another job. Did you think that was going to be your last job or like when you no. showed up with a thousand hours, you know? Okay. So it was going to be another stepping stone to what you wanted to do. I had no agenda whatsoever. Yeah. I just wanted to fly helicopters. I wanted to expose myself to complication. I wanted to go in the mountains. I wanted to go to the desert. I wanted to just fly everywhere. In my mind, I was not going to be based in one, one place, uh, like some helicopter pilots do, you know, they, because a helicopter pilots is more localized, like in one place. And then you just mm -hmm. work in those mountains, let's say. You as a jet pilot, you can go to Abu Dhabi, you can go to this, you can go to that. So you're not, you know, mm -hmm. even if you live in Orlando, it doesn't mean you're not flying to China. So as a helicopter, it's a different. But so to me, it was going to be global, but I had no plan. I was just going as it goes. And 
each time I was starting to get comfortable, then I wanted to move on, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Shake things up a little bit, right? That's it. Yeah. 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 So what did you do? How did, did you look for another job? Did you, someone come job hunt you? How did you eventually move on from that job? No, I always, uh, went on a fishing expedition. So I always, okay. so, uh, after that, uh, job in Paris, I went to South of France and I wanted to do long line. I wanted to do long line and I wanted to work in the mountains. So I went in the South of France, where the Alps are, the, the French mountains over there, they're pretty high and they go to 14, 15,000 mm -hmm. feet. So pretty high. Um, and it's like steep and, you know, it's cliff. It's not like a roundy mountain. It's like scary mm. as hell. So I went there and I started to do long line and then long line them, um, in the book, you laugh uh, your ass off. So in fact, before I go there, when I was in Paris, the chief pilot told me one day, Fred, there's one guy he's sick. He's not there. You need to go. And you have to understand it's in the eighties. So it's not the same than uh -huh. today. And back then in France, there were, there was a, that, that helicopter company was, taking Santa Claus for Christmas and then putting the Santa Claus to the school. So we're picking up the Santa Claus under the helicopter on the line. And then we're dropping the dude in the school with all the kids watching. Okay. Santa That's Claus. Weird. So I was not supposed to do that. I was not trained to do that. So the Santa Claus story is pretty hilarious today. It was not hilarious back then, but there was a, so basically we're picking up the guy on the outside of the school and all the kids, you know, uh, four to 10 years old, you know, a couple of hundreds were there waiting for Santa Claus. The wall was maybe 15 feet up around the school. So pick yeah. up the dude 300 yards from that wall. I never done that. So I don't have a mirror. I don't know. How, so I'm looking down and I, I have no clue about the depth. There is nobody at the radio to give me thing. Long story short, I lift up the guy and then I go up above the wall, but the guy is going to hit the damn wall. Like there's no way he's going to pass. So people can see him trying to climb because he can see the wall is coming his way. And then the poor Santa Claus slammed into the wall. Like I was not going fast, but he hit the wall. But worse of the worse, I keep going, which means he, he, he's being dragged, he dragged above the wall. <laughs> and then I dropped the Santa Claus and you can see he's not in good shape in front of those kids. So they're traumatized for life because the Santa Claus now is a wreck. They will never be a helicopter pilot, those guys, ever, oh my I guess. Gosh. So anyway, that's a Santa Claus story. It's in the book and it's funny as hilarious right now. But it took me a while to recover because it's like I, I really hurt a Santa Claus. You know, it, it's not good for the uh, resume. <laughs> that's hilarious. So anyway, it's it was... I'll keep going. That was one thing. And then I decided I wanted to be a long line pilot because come on. So then look, they didn't do anything bad to me at the time because it's not, it was my fault, but I should not have done that job. I should have been under supervision. I should have somebody to tell me how to do it. Even if it's my fault, you know, if it was today, I would say, well, I'm not qualified. I can't do it. But back in the days, you know, he said, shut the fuck up, go. Sure. I'm going to go. So anyway, I went yeah. to the South of France and I did long line. And mm -hmm. something else happened there. Um, I, I, I kind of started the long line program, but I was, I was, it was just the beginning of it. And again, one pilot was sick and they asked me to go drop a swimming pool. Uh, back then in France, we had those big fiber swimming pool that you could drop. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm sure they may still do it today with cranes and stuff. And, but so because of the downwash, uh, you, you have to take them from a truck and they upside down. You lift them up sideways and then you take them sideways and you put them in the, in the, in the, in the pit and then you put them down. So, but it's it. a 300 feet line because you have to be very far from the pool. So the downwash doesn't create a problem. That day was a windy as hell. Again, the chief pilot tell me you're going to go drop that pool, but I never done that. And the, the, the company back then told them, you know, it's pretty windy. We would prefer to reschedule. To, to drop your, huh. your pool. And the guys, the, the owner of the house said, no, 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 I really want to do it. You know, all my work is ready. The guy was insisting. So I guess the chief pilot said, Fred, you're going to go do that. It was a windy day. Never done that. 300 feet line. It's very far from you. Really, really far. The helicopter is shaking as hell. It took me like 15 minutes to pick up the pool. Then I'm getting so that that house was on a slope. And it was a one story house with a big, a lot of windows in the front and the pool was, of course, in front of the house. 
if that guy wanted like a, a moving company to empty his house for all the furniture, he should have called me that day because I took care of it properly. So what happened is the pool came close to the house, went inside the house, destroyed no. all the pillars, went inside the house and basically got out of the house with everything in there. I destroyed the house, the roof of the house collapsed it. It was a disaster. And then after that event, because I didn't know what to do, because now I can't even drop the pool because I'm so par like scared as hell. It's like, it took me 45 minutes to drop the pool back to the truck. Horrible. So anyway, I'm just telling that because people think that I'm like oh. the Hollywood stunt pilot that I know my shit. Of course I do, but I, I, I had to learn the hard way. It was not easy to do. So in the book, there's plenty of story like that. That is so funny now. <laughs> Right. Um, dying, yeah. And I, I had, you know, oh, my, yeah. I had to pay my dues. Let's put it that way. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's good to know, right? Like everyone on Instagram or on, in seeing Hollywood, you see a highlight reel, right? You see what you're doing right now. Uh, what they don't see is that they don't see you almost killing Santa Claus. Yeah. <laughs> they right. don't see kind of the struggles yeah. or they just think it's all great. They think that you're just the best pilot and you never had anything bad that's happen. Correct. And they experience one failure yeah. and they just completely just don't know how to, come come across that or battle that adversity. Yeah. But everyone battles adversity. Some people destroy homes. Uh, some people have engine failures. It just like, it's just something part of the, the industry. And, you just and, gotta get and I think if you don't go through those things, uh, you're going to be more dangerous, I think. Because, because yeah. you know, I understand consequences and liabilities. And I understand that my actions are so important. Like I, I can make a, a life difference. It's the same for you. You carry passengers, all that stuff. So mm -hmm. we carry a, a heavy weight on our shoulder you know, the consequences of our action. The, but the problem is when you do your training, it's only words, you know, you have to experience that. And we, I don't wish, wish anyone to experience that. Luckily for me, it was, it was non, you know, life-threatening event, but I had some close call in my life. And, and even today when I do yeah. my stunt stuff and everything, it's still a heavy way to carry, you know? Yeah, I bet. Yeah. No, oh, absolutely. I mean, the farther you get in your, your career, right? The stakes just get higher, right? Like yeah. I mean, for you, it was the, it was the house, it was Santa Claus. And yeah. now it's <laughs> actors. No, you're right. Uh, you're right. Yeah. yeah. So, so I can't, uh, you know, I have to be so careful and we prep so much when we do stunt stuff and we are so careful the way we structure the job to try to minimize the risk and because mm -hmm. the risk is there. So we don't, we mm -hmm. don't deny that is there. So how do we manage the risk? That's basically aviation, right? Because we, as soon as we yeah. go off the ground, that's it risk is there. So how we manage the risk, how we structure the risk, how we reduce it as much as possible. And then we deal with it, you know, but that's, I think it's a heavy load for any pilots out there. And I think the people that never had issues or never had to struggle with, I think it's more complicated for them because I don't think they realize, you know, sometimes how responsible they can be, you know. Yeah. And I feel like there's always the kind of like something's going to happen eventually. Right. So if you get a couple of things out of the way, you get a little bit more comfortable. You're like, well, I handled that so I can handle something else. Yeah. But if you don't ever have anything, you might like in the back of your mind, you might just be thinking like, all right, something's got to happen soon. Something's got to happen soon. So I don't know. Yeah. I see both sides. Like you want to be the best pilot ever and you don't ever want anything to happen, but you learn from those things and you just become a better pilot. No, you learn and, from and, bad people, yeah. other people's mistakes, your mistakes, et cetera. And like you say, you know, eventually you'll get something. We all, all get something. You know, all, all the old timer guys mm. like me, you know, in my 21,000 hours, there's so many things that happen. I was, you know, lucky enough that, uh, you know, nothing happened, like really dr dramatic, but yeah. it was also lucky, you know, I'm, I manage each time, but, uh, you know, a, 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 such a small thing could have make a difference, you know? So, uh, how long do those, how long do those kind of close calls or those bad moments in aviation, how long do they stick with you personally, mentally? Like, after they happen, is it immediately just get out of your brain and kind of uh, don't think about it again? Or the next time you're flying, is it like, are you, is it in the back of your mind making you anxious about the flight? So each time I had a close call or I did something, you know, I did a mistake and then something happened. I immediately went back to flying a few minutes after that or as soon as I could, like the next day to flush it out. That was the first thing. And then after that, it was very important for me to, to blame myself. Like I had, I made a mistake. Okay. It's my fault. Okay. Not trying to find excuses. Like it's, I, so what did I do wrong that took me to this incident or mm -hmm. because if you don't admit to have made the mistake, it's very hard for you to, to evolve from that. 
If you're blaming yeah, somebody else, your cool. ego, yeah. you know. So you have to make sure that your ego doesn't control that part. Because you need to have ego to have confidence in aviation. Yeah. So that's why sometimes a lot of pilots are, the very good pilots out there, they have an ego so big that they are not friendly, you know, because they think they're so fucking badass, whatever. So I'm really careful to not be like this. Even if you need yeah. the ego to build your confidence, you don't want the bad ego. So when something happened like that, sure. don't let the bad ego driving the event. So I, w I sure. wanted to make sure that it's my fault. So, okay, sh what should I have done different? What, how I should handle it? When did I make the mistake? What should I do better? Sometimes it's not a direct mistake that led it to the issue, but somehow in that chain of event, to a point of, I made the decision to go this direction or this direction, you know. So I go through that and then I, I try to go through the, the motion of everything that happened in details so I can then forget about it. Yeah. But I need to go through that. So that takes me a few months because it's, it's, it's always a heavy thing for me to carry. Like I, I really hate that stuff. And um, each time something happened, which is it's rare. But when something yeah. happens, even if it's a close call for something, um, even sometimes if it's not directly related to me, it can be a stunt guy that make uh, there's a, a wrong timing. It's not a mistake on his part. It's just a wrong timing, which is easy, yeah. uh, hard to get sometimes. So yeah. when we did the Extraction 2 movie, I don't know if you watched it on Netflix. Yeah. I land on a moving train and there's five guys that get out at 60 miles an hour and five guys get out. <laughs> and... One, one, we were doing the, the training. There is a, a, a time where the fifth guy that was the last one in the helicopter to get out on the train. He, for reason. So what happened is because when I was on the train with one skid on the train, I could not look in front of me because there were some trees coming up. So somebody was telling me when I had to go because I only I had the 22 seconds to do the gag because there was trees at the beginning and okay. trees at the end. So I was not looking there because I had to look at the train because I was landing on it. They were telling me when the last guy was out and when I could go because they wanted like a sexy, you know, like leaving like a badass. And the guy that was gave me the action to go told me to go when four guys were out, not five. But what happened is because I, I was already one skid off the train, I was already on the way. So when he told me to go, I felt there was one more guy there, but I was already on my way out. At this point, there was no way for me to stop. When we did the training, I told that guy, I, I told all the stuntmen, when you're going to make the decision to get out of the helicopter, it's up to you. Like you have to commit or stay on board. But if I'm going and then you're in between, it's your call. At that point, I can't stop. I have two five tons machine going off. I'm gone. Yeah. That guy he stop, decided right? to, to to keep going because he has one foot yeah. on. There was a bench uh, on the side of the helicopter. So he got on the bench and then he had to jump on the train. When I left, he was still on the bench. So now I'm going this way. And then he went off. He went at 15 feet up in the air. We were going 60 oh, miles an hour on the train. The train is only eight feet wide. huh? And he landed right on the middle of the train. And we put nets on each side, little nets, just in case he, uh, one of the stern was falling off. He stayed in the yeah. middle. But what I mean is, it's, it's a, so there was a communication issue. The guy, my guy thought he was five guy, but it was four. So, you know, there's always something but even if, so everything went well, not a problem, but it could have been bad. Because if he would have yeah. jumped like half a second later, he would have jumped on the track and you know, it would have been super bad. So it's not easy what I do as a stunt film no, pilot. Definitely not. But I don't think anyone would ever assume that what you do no, is No, but easy. sometimes in, social media yeah. people assume that, oh, you know, that guy can do anything and that kind of stuff. It, oh. It's not like that, you know. Um, how did you, so it's kind of like get caught up to where you are today. How did you get into this? Um, I know that kind of, you sound like the kind of guy that like opportunities come calling to you and you kind of decipher like if that sounds fun to you or not, right? Will that bring you joy? It's probably not about money to you at all. You probably just love flying if I'm, if I yeah. can call it correctly, like you said. So how did this even opportunity come up? Like what was someone like, I know the perfect guy for you. He's in France. You need to get him right now. Like what, tell me about that story. So First of all, for something to say, opportunities come to you. So to me, in fact, it's the reverse. I think before I explain, you know, how I, I got from, you know, Africa to France and to Hollywood business, um, to be successful as a pilot or anything, in fact, in life, I believe that you have to expose yourself. 
And how you do that? Okay, you have to travel. You, when I say travel, you can go from your house to another city. You, have, you don't have to go to China, but you it, go outside of your circle, go meet people, do a dance class, do uh, whatever you want to do. Go to a, a, a club, a aviation club where the airport is close to you. Go say hi, uh, just go share experience, talk to the pilots, so just expose yourself because if you do that, opportunities will come your way. If you don't expose yourself, nothing is going to happen. So you're the only person that can make opportunities come to you. But for that reason, you have to expose. So why I'm saying that? Because that's my, the way I do things. So mm -hmm. when I was flying in France, after all those uh, Santa Claus and little story I told you, I learned long line. <laughs> I've done a lot of search and rescue and I became a more uh, comfortable pilot, um, you know, yeah. not destroying Santa Claus anymore. And, um, and I did a lot of... Uh, like the Barra race that you have in the US, but called the Paris Dakar, which is like a Barra race, but all over Africa. And with the helicopters, I was filming those race. Um, and I started to do it for the TV industry. So the TV industry mm. is not the movie industry. It's two different things. Um, it took me a long time to understand that the difference as a pilot to work for the TV industry versus the film industry is as a TV, uh, the TV industry, when you fly as a helicopter pilot for even a fixed wing, if you're filming an event like a Formula One race or um, a Barra race, it's not that much the way you're shooting it. It's make sure you're going to shoot the finish line, who's starting, who is ending. They want to know what's going on on the ground because that's what matters. Of course, if mm -hmm. you get a beautiful sunset, they're going to say fantastic, but don't get the beautiful sunset and not get the car that is finishing, finishing the race. So that's TV business, which means there is not a lot of creative part. You have to fill up the contract because that they need to know who is number 89, uh, shoot number five, make sure you get number six finishing the line. So I did that for a few years without understanding really those things. Um, mm -hmm. And then one day I did a, a movie in uh, Venezuela with a, a director of photography, the guy that did Top Gun, the first Top Gun. Okay. And that guy explained to me. So I, the reason I went in Venezuela is because exactly what you said. They wanted, they, they, they had a, a helicopter in Venezuela that just been bought from a French company, uh, in, 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 in Venezuela. And they, the registration was a French registration. So they needed a pilot that had the French license to fly that French registered aircraft. They, they did their homework and they f find out that I was the guy in France at the time to hire. So they call me and they say, would you want to come to Venezuela to shoot our film? And I said, but I'm not part of the helicopter company because ba back then, even today, if you go to a helicopter company, you get a pilot with it. Yeah. I, right. I said, no, no, but there's a job in the U.S. called a film pilot and you would be basically a film pilot hired by uh, production. I said, really? There's a job as film pilot? Like you just yourself? He said, yes. I said, that's unbelievable. But I said, how many are, are there? He said, there's like five in the U.S. and one in Europe. I said, whoa, that's amazing. So that's when I realized that there was, in fact, a job that would apply to me. You know, I yeah. would have not known, you know. And then he told me, you know, we're going to pay you. Back then, it was, um, they were going to pay me $1,000 a day. Back then, you have to understand, I was making $1,000 a month. Yeah, okay. I'm, and I was not into money. The but <laughs> I'm not into money. But when somebody's telling you, you're going to make in one day what you make in one month. It is like, okay, I'm in, you know, and, and then, so I went, didn't think about the money. You know, I, I, for three weeks, I did the job and everything. What it taught me is if you shoot for a movie, the way you shoot in the sequence is the, the, the reason you're telling the story. So let's say you're filming a car going from an airport to the city. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because the guy just landed and he's going to the city. There's a dialogue in the car. If it was for TV, the only thing they wanted to know is going from the airport to the town. But us in the film industry, if it's a four second shot or a 45 second shot, you're not going to shoot it the same way. So I'll have to, if you just go from the airport to the city, it's a boring shot. So I have to start with a plane landing, go to the terminal, get the car while driving on the highway, that timing right, like a seamless shot. And when I, and then I get to the car, I zoom into the car, then the dialogue start. And then the guy, blah, 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 blah. Then when he's done talking, I zoom out, I go behind the car and the guy goes toward the city and I see the city where he's going. So that's movie. 
when TV will be just to show where the, the damn car go. So I, I learned yeah. that the film pilot has a huge input on the creative part, which I love. Even as of today, I love being part of the creative because you are dolly grip. You're the one moving the camera. You become the camera. And as a camera pilot, I love that. You know, like I'm the image. I'm the one. The helicopter doesn't exist anymore. So that's from that film mm. in Venezuela. I understood all those principles. And then from that yeah. film, I decided to invest my effort, energy, money, time towards the film industry, you know, to become a film pilot. When um, kind of early on in the story, when you first went to America, English wasn't kind of like a, a your best language. When did English come? Was it just like a constant practice? Like a lot of TV shows were in English. Everything was kind of English. You kind of picked up from it. Or did you have to make a concerted effort to really kind of like become fluent in English? Obviously, when you when you take your aviation test, you have to have some kind of proficiency in English. So I assume it had to do something with that as well, right? Well, I mean, the truth is, is when you do your FAA uh, commercial license, the English doesn't need to be that great. Because mm. what do you do? You do your commercial test, but it's 600 questions in the that you have to learn. So yeah, but aviation words, you know, usually uh, basic pilots, we, we know wind, yeah. vent in French, you know, you, uh, weather forecast, yeah. meteo, you know, it, it's, the words are not that far apart. Um, helicopter, helicopters, you know, so anyway, you, you know, words that are similar in, in all languages. Right. In Spanish, helicopteros, you know, it's not that far away. So I had basic, but what happened is, while I was becoming a film pilot in France, I mean, from France all over the world, but not in the US, American production was starting to call me. So I slowly by slowly learn English on the street, as we say, like, like not at school. Remember, I'm terrible at learning stuff at school. So I'm not good to, uh, to take a book and try to learn stuff. Not my thing. Yeah, you need the real world. End of the sense. So then I had like an yep. English that was kind of okay, from an American perspective, which means an American guy coming to France, talking to me, it was, that was okay mm. with that. But I, wouldn't, I was not okay to be a French guy living in LA, which is a different perspective. Because if you come yeah. to me in France and my English shit, you're going you're gonna to tell me, oh, your English is not bad. Now, if, if we go to, I go to LA and you talk to me, what the fuck is that English? You know, so <laughs> it was different. So then slowly by slowly, I had a bit of wordings and then at... Um, 40 years old, that's when I made the decision to go to LA to do, to go yeah. to the US to do the amazing American movies, to do the big action movies. I had to be in LA to be known in the US because mm. American production, they bring their own pilots everywhere in the world because they need to have that, that, uh, trust relationship and to know the person, to make sure that person knows what he's doing. They will not use a local guy because they don't know if that guy knows his thing. Exactly. And the percent. Exactly. So then that's when I decided to move. When I moved to the US, I was 40 years old. Nobody's waiting for you. Nowhere. Okay. I only knew one guy in the US, the, the guy that I flew in Venezuela, Larry Blanford, mm -hmm. that did the first Top Gun. And he told me, Fred, I will help you, but it's not going to be easy because the other pilots, they're not going to be welcome you there. And it's not going to be easy to have the producers trust you. You nobody, your English shit. Uh, you know, you don't know anything. You don't know the rules in the US. You don't know I had nothing. So I did my FAA license. And anyway, it was not easy. You know, my first job was in New York on the Brooklyn Bridge. I had no FAA permit. I even didn't know you needed an FAA permit. I shot the damn car 50 feet from the cars, open traffic, crazy. Don't do that at home. I'm telling you, don't do that. But it was 20 years ago, you know. And I didn't know. And then I learned and, you know, I yeah. made my mistake. And then, um, it, it, you know, look in the book, I'm explaining plenty of stuff for that. I explain all the little yeah. things. Um, the journey was not easy. Um, I, I, I got denied for a visa. My wife was pregnant. I had, uh, I put all my money into the US to LA. I had no, I was not coming back to France. One way ticket. And I put all my effort and at the end, I resolved all my issues. I got my visa, I got my kids, I, I, I got my license. I, I have proper FA permits and all that stuff. Uh, but it was not an easy thing to do because at 40 years old to reinvent yourself in a foreign country. But I have to say, you know, America is amazing for that because it's a cliche, but it's a true cliche. American people, they give you opportunities. Like it doesn't matter from where you're coming from. They let you, if you have skill, you have talent and you're a hardworking person, you will succeed in America. 1000%. 
The same thing doesn't apply in Europe. Even if you know what mm. you're doing and you're successful, the, the French people, they're too much judgment because of the history of what, you know, we're coming from. But in America, because you got more adventure, you know, it's, it's a, it's a multiplex of people coming to the, U that came to the US, you know, from Europe, from everywhere, from Ireland, from, mm. you know, the Indians, all that stuff. It's just, it's a different. So I really had a, a chance, you know, so thank you, the American for that, that I was able to <laughs> succeed in here. And I'm, I'm a happy guy here and aviation in the U S awesome. is fantastic. You know, I love yeah. it. Um, how many, how many films have you shot? Do you, do you have like an, any ideas that it's kind of like this all builds up and you don't think about how many? No, there is a website called imdb.com. Yeah. industry movie yeah. database and if you go there and you put my name there's like 240 movies or something um so do you have a favorite movie are you allowed to say like this is my favorite like top five or anything I mean, like that? it's hard to say because each time i do a crazy sequence uh it's it you know i really love when we we do it like there's a team effort for the creative part mm -hmm. like the fast and furious movie i can i can contribute to the creative part and give guidance to director and give ideas and then we do it, and I love to see that stuff on film. Uh, Michael Bay is an amazing director to work with. On uh, his vision is insane of this world. Uh, the guy that uh, directed the extraction, uh, Sam Hargrave, is an amazing director, um, open to creative. You know, uh, I just did Beverly Hills Cops Four, that is not out yet. Eddie oh, Murphy, cool. uh, Mark Molloy, that director is super cool. You know. Uh, yeah. And all the directors, they're they're in their zone. Like they they're not in this planet. So you have to understand their vision, extract that, and really try to, 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 to offer what you can do with the helicopter beyond what they can think, you know? Right. It's our job to suggest that, you know? So I love that. Have you had any interaction? I mean, there are some actors, right, that are pilots that fly. I mean, ones that come to your mind, like Tom Cruise, uh, Harrison Ford. Um, there's, there's more, obviously. John Travolta, that's one that everyone thinks of. But... Have you had any kind of like um, interactions between other pilots just talking about aviation, talking about the helicopters? Has anyone just been like, man, that's really cool? Like, have you ever gotten anyone into helicopters, into aviation, that kind of thing? No, for sure. But, um, you know, some of the actors you just uh, listed, so some of them are extremely focused on themselves and some others yeah. are more open to aviation. So I love having a conversation with, with the one that are, that are open to aviation and less about themselves. Sure. You know, um, because some of them, they use their image and they use aviation for their image. Some yeah, others that sure. you name here, they're using aviation for the passion of it. With those guys, I love sharing stories. With the other ones, it's not my deal to be an actor and that stuff. So I, I let them yeah. be, you know, but the, the, the ones that are passionate, yes, I love, I love it because they have everything, but they don't have what you, what, what we have are tremendous experience because we're professional. They would love that. Like John Travolta is so passionate about it. It's, it's amazing to share stories with them. You know, it's mm -hmm. always a, a good moment to have conversation with those guys, but um, some of them are more passionate than others, you know? Yeah. Talk about, a. let's just say today or tomorrow, you're going to go shoot a movie. It's a very complex scene. Ta give me a little kind of a cliff notes of like the planning the execution and kind of the post-production or the, the post-flight, like kind of go from how you're going to do it, how you actually do it, and then what you do afterwards. Yeah, so usually eight, nine months before the, uh, the movie is going to happen, I get the script from the director. And it's usually not a final script, it's just a storyline. And then he's telling me the idea for the aerial sequence. So then I take that, I work on it, and I, I tell him what's feasible, what's not feasible, how we should structure the story. I'm, I'm putting input, I'm changing a few things that we can add, then I sent back to him. Then six months pass by. Then I get a phone call from the producer doing the, the show. And then he's asking me with that script now to give him a budget. So then um, I give him, you know, um, like uh, the, he wants to know how many days to do that, that piece. So I'm the one to try to find out. Um, so to do that, it's not always easy to know how many days I need to shoot the sequence. So I usually, mm -hmm. they usually give me what we call a storyboard on paper. And I usually take a scissor, I cut each image, I put it on the floor and I put it per day that I think we can do, you know, I do it like this. And then I tell him, okay, we need 10 days for the sequence. I'm going to, we need those aircraft with those pilots for the permits. That's what we should do with the FAA It's going to take this. We need to do some training. We need to rehearse. So let's say we tell him three days to, to, to rehearse training on our own. 
and then 10 days to do the shots. Um, so 13 days, then I put a, an aerial budget for it. Then I send that back to him. Then three, four months goes by. And then now he's telling me, okay, Fred, we're going to start in March. So two months from now. And then now I'm lining up the aircraft. I'm, uh, you know, doing all that prep, uh, choosing the aircraft, the crew, doing the FA permits, you know, doing the scout. So I go physically there or my team go, we check in all the bridges. If I have to go under, if it's a night shoot, we're going to do, we go all that prep. And then we do the, the, the prep itself. So we go with the helicopters, the crew, we do the training. In the meantime, you know, I've sat down with my team. We, we work on the, everybody has input and we work as a collaboration team. And then, um, and then, then we do the gag, you know, and when the, the sequence mm -hmm. is over, then, you know, we take a champagne and, uh, you know, and, uh, Always champagne? No, I don't drink alcohol, but uh, something. Yes. <laughs> I never had yeah. a drop of alcohol in my life, by the way. Oh, man. Coming from France yeah. or being a Frenchman? That's, but, a, that's like a sin, right? My wife drinks for me. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. I like the champagne. I'll drink champagne for you, too. So it's yeah. all good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, how, I mean, I know we're getting close to an hour. I got a couple more questions for you, but when you're in the shot, there's so many variables that can delay, right? Whether it's clouds, whether it's just weather in general, whether people get sick, um, how does that affect the people that don't understand aviation or the, how weather can affect everything? Like the producer wants a shot. They don't understand that. All right, there's a 50 knot. The winds are just too strong for us to shoot today. Oh, it's a beautiful day. What are you talking about? Let's get it done. How do you kind of deal with the personalities around this to get the job done? So the older you get, so at my, at my level and my age, people, if I say, you know, we cannot do it because of the wind, nobody's going to argue on it. The problem was more in my, in my, when I was younger, when I was like 30 years old and mm -hmm. people were not listening to me because I was just a pilot versus now I'm coming with the reputation and the history. So mm -hmm. in Hollywood, because people are extremely professional in, in the aerial world, because they've been doing aerial work for decades and they know impact, you know, uh, yeah, there's some famous accidents that happen on a, you know, movie, uh, like Twilight Zone or other things that it's still yeah. present in people's minds. So if you say no, I'm a, they're usually asking me, what will be your wind limit? Let's say there is a, you know, we, if we work in, in Chicago, for example, where it's a wind city. They will tell me, you know, what will be your limitation? And I said, it depends what we do. If we're on the lake, I can fly 35 knots, not a problem. But if it's in the city between buildings, 20 knots is a max. So I, I give them those numbers before we do the show. And then on the day, it's always windy over there. I mean, it's very rarely that there's no wind in Chicago, for example. And we had mm -hmm. that problem on the movie Rampage um, yeah. with uh, Dwayne Johnson. And that was between buildings, crazy wind. And I told them, you know, we had to stop. And uh, it cost them, it was a Sunday. We only had the, the city, 10 blocks. We owned the 10 blocks downtown uh, Chicago for uh, four hours, Sunday morning from 8 to 12. And it cost them a million dollars to buy all the businesses, all the streets. You know, it's a million dollars for four hours. That's not the cost of the yeah. production, it's just to buy everybody out. And then I told the producer, you know, it's too windy. I can do it. And they don't, they don't, um, they said, no problem, Fred. We're going to do it another day. There's no question. So they relay on me to make that decision. And they know that when, when I tell them, they know that I'm on my max. Like I'm not the kind of guy that will, if there is a, a little, I think you can maybe do it. They know I'm going to do it. But if I say no, yeah. that means there is a wall and I can't do it. So it's, it's yep. not a problem. Never a problem. Do you now? Obviously, these are kind of like your minimums and kind of your kind of safeguards. But I'm guessing through this, you have to have some sort of insurance, right? Like you can't just go out there. But is there anything? Does insurance guide any of this? Um, how to, insurance is huge in aviation. Kind of dictates who you can hire, how you can do stuff, how you can fly. Um, is there any difficulties with that with this kind of uh, this kind of job? Because you're flying way closer than anyone else flies the stuff. You're flying faster, um, doing crazy stuff. Like I mean, there's no other really. <laughs> it's cool, but it's like it's people don't do this every day. No, helicopters. but. So I have the same insurance broker for 20 years, first of all. So we okay. have a relationship. Okay. So they know me. Um, and their name is Telling Risk, by the way. They're amazing, you know, insurance company. And then yeah. they, the thing with insurance in general, they need to understand exactly how you do your operation. Okay. Most of the time they're very expensive because they put you in a box and they don't really understand what you're doing, but you're, okay. You're doing mm -hmm. school or training. Boom. You're in that box, but they don't know the way you're doing it. Okay. You do, search and rescue 
they put you in that box. But everybody has a different way to approach uh, risk. They have a safety mm -hmm. uh, program that is different. Everybody's doing different for safety. So the way I do my film work, they know. So I, I invite my insurance broker on set. He can see what I'm doing. Um, I'm trying to have a conversation with the underwriter. I say, can I talk to them? Sometimes my insurance guys say, absolutely not. But as a joke, you know, but now with my social media, they can see what I'm doing. There is no, yeah. so I'd rather work in transparency with insurance and tell them that's how I do the business. And, and we're super safe. We're very careful. Is there a risk? Yes, but we manage it yeah. and we have insurance to cover it. Now, I don't want to use my insurance, um, but you know, that's where they are uh, for, and it's expensive, but there is a uh, transparency and they understand how we mm. do, you know, manage safety. You know? It's funny. It kind of sounds, did you ever see the movie Along Came Polly? Yeah. With ben Stiller? Yeah. It kind of sounds like that, like Ben Stiller, that's your insur insurance agent that's trying to get the guy that's jumping off Remember. mountains, that's jumping off base jumping. Yeah. So that you, you were that guy, the insurance agent's um, going after, trying to figure out why they're so why they're doing this and how they It's the same it. with the so FAA, cool. by the way, because when we do our crazy shit, I bring the FAA yeah. to the set. I'm inviting them to the set. And I'm because I want them to be responsible with me also. Like come to the set and see what we do and see the way we structure the job. So so they understand because uh, the way I see it with the FAA, we're a team. It's not them against mm -hmm. me. I'm not me against them. I'm not trying to hide them something. I want them to know what I'm going to be doing, the way I'm doing it. I don't want them to tell me no. I want them to help me protect the public because it's my responsibility and it's, uh, it's for them to make sure we do. But I want to do it as a team. I don't like when somebody says no, an inspector mm -hmm. and fuck off, you know, I don't like that. I always tell them, please act as a team. I'm not against you. Let's do it together. You know, so anyway. Yeah, definitely. Um, what, what What's like one or two kind of scenes? I know you already shared one with a guy jumping off like 15 feet in the air, uh, almost killing Santa Claus, <laughs> a little bit different, but um, is there any, I guess it's a better question. Was there any time that you've been in a stunt and it's just been too much and you haven't been able to do it? It was just um, either got too reckless, it got too kind of out of control. Um, is there any kind of like mid shoot stunt that you just like absolutely could not do, couldn't finish the job? I mean, usually we never go to that point because when they telling mm -hmm. me, you know, what we're going to be doing and let's say they want to do something crazy. But I mean, usually, first of all, I work with a stunt coordinator. So the stunt mm -hmm. coordinator that is managing all the stunt guys and everything, I mean, I'm the aerial coordinator is the stunt coordinator. Usually we, uh, we, we as safe as possible, both of us. So if there is like a jump, I did a, a movie called The Fall Guy with, uh, you know, Ryan Gosling. It's, it's uh, the trailer yeah. just came out yesterday. And, cool. and we did some crazy stuff on that movie. And the stunt coordinator, Chris O'Hara, fantastic guy. There was a jump, uh, with the highest jump that we we're supposed to do from a helicopter with a stunt guy that was going to jump. You know, like, like, like it was um, 150 feet. So really high. Oh, damn. And... So when we prep a sequence like that, we do it together, which means we, we, what do you think we should do this? And no, let's do it that way. So it's a, it's a hundred percent collaboration that is opened. There is no, that we're never going to do something. And the, the stunt guys will never put me in a corner and I will never put them in a corner. So we never get to that point where you, you know, I'm going to say no, because I would have said no way before that happened. Right. Um, it was more, uh, back in the days when I was, uh, 30 years old, 20 years old. And then I was doing some stunt stuff without prepping much. And, you know, yeah. I did some crazy stuff on a movie called Transporter, the first one. And there was a guy oh, hanging yeah. under the helicopter. And I mean, with some crazy shit. And back then we were prepping like the morning off because I didn't know yeah. any better. And nobody knew any better. It was in France. And, uh, you know, back then the stunt stuff was, let's do this. Okay, let's go. But I don't do that anymore. You know, I don't do that anymore. So... I don't, I don't, I will never let that situation happen because we will, we will resolve it uh, ahead of time. Someone that is listening to this, watches your Instagram stuff. They see what you're doing. They want to do what you want to do, right? They want to do helicopters. They see the cool stuff you post. What would you recommend to them? Uh, obviously it's not like a, a cut and dry, like this is how you get here. There's many different routes they could take, but what would you recommend to someone that wants to do something you do? So the first thing, and look, I'm not pushing for the book because I'm making zero money with my book. Okay. It's, it's, it's <laughs> zero. So now I'm, I'm, I'm losing money on it, but so it doesn't matter to that. But the reason I did the book is because I wanted to, 
to, to, to for the people to know how I got there. So I'm explaining everything in there. I'm just going to tell tell you quickly, but I would say that the 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 most important thing is if you if you want to be a stunt pilot, let's say a, a film pilot, your personality need to match that job. It's not just as a film pilot. Let's say you want to be a, what you're doing. I think to be the guy, to be the guy that is the pilot doing something and not just a pilot, your personality need to match whatever skill you have. Because if the personality doesn't match what you're going to be doing, you're just going to be an average person. So right. you have to make sure that, that whatever you want to be is who you really are internally. And like, uh, you know, instinctive person versus a technical person. Like for me, I'm an ins instinctive person. I am making decision on the spot. I have a gut feeling that I can do it. I'm convinced I can do it. I don't know why. A technical person will need to go through the protocol. He will go through the business plan, the business model. He has a, um, you know, a, a list of things to do for him to do it. Mm -hmm. Me, I, I don't do it that way. So like I would be a terrible airline pilot. I would be a terrible uh, jet pilot because I know I'm not, yeah. I'm not good for that. But for what I do, I'm really good at it because my personality match that. So I, I just want them to make sure that they're aligning those two elements to be mm -hmm. an expert. And that's the other thing. Become an expert in one machine. Okay. Don't go with five aircraft. One. Master that one. Yesterday I went to a school, um, you know, in the independent helicopters upstate New York. And I did a book signing yeah. there and I spoke to those young uh, pilots. And they were like, 30 guys. And I said, so all those guys flying on Robinson helicopter, those small ones, the two seaters to do the training. And I said, can you, can you tell me who know the uh, flight manual of the Robinson by heart? Who in this room know the flight manual by heart? Two, two guys on 30. And I said, you see, you guys want to be expert. You just beginning. You should know the damn thing by heart. And I told him, Eight years ago, I had the flight manual on the helicopter that I've, I have 17,000 hours on next to my bed. My wife was there. She confirmed that the thing, the 400 pages was next to my bed. And once in a while, I read it because we forget. So be an expert on one machine only because it's impossible to be an expert on five aircraft. And you'll be recognized as an expert. And then if you recognize as an expert, you'll make more money. You'll have more uh, gratification from your peers. You'll have more respect from your peers and you'll be in demand because there's not that many experts. Okay. So try to be that expert. It doesn't matter which machine, you know, be the best in that aircraft. So I'm just telling all the pilots out there, choose and go for it. Full blast, you know, and then create opportunities yeah. for yourself. You're a jet pilot. Let's say you want to work with NASA one day. Nothing's stopping you to go to NASA, try to get a, an appointment with the aviation people and, and, and get that relationship going. There's nothing preventing you. They're not going to come to you. Go to them. The only thing they may say is no, but it'll be on them. You'll say, I'm a young pilot mm -hmm. or I'm a, yeah, 5,000 hours. My dream is to work for NASA. Can I just talk to you for 15 minutes? Can you show me your experience? Just expose yourself. Don't wait for things to come to you because they don't. Or if they do, it'll take forever. So that's the other thing, yeah. you know, go and knock at doors. Like, if you want to be a stunt pilot, send me a message. I respond on my social media. Each of you guys, I respond, you know. Don't ask me, you know, what the weather is, of course, but ask me something legit and I'll respond to you, each of you. That's why I did the book. Plus, you know, all that stuff. So that's that would be my recommendation. Yeah. All right, Fred, thank you so much. Thanks for spending an hour of your time with me. Uh, I want to go ahead and give me the opportunity, or not the opportunity, but tell everyone where they can buy the book, uh, the best place to buy it follow you, do all kind of those social media things and let everyone know uh, how they can support you. And uh, Thank you so much. So yeah, the court. book is called Flying Sideways and you can all get right. it on, on my social media, on Instagram. There's a link shop. You can click there. Very easy. You can also get it by Amazon. Um, easy to get. Uh, you can get it for Barnes and Nobles. There's plenty, any library you can go, you ask them, they will get it uh, to you. Um, you know, uh, it, it, that book is very easy to read. Um, you, you have the QR code at the end that is really fun to, uh, to do. And it's like me talking. It's like me telling the story when you read the book, we, it was very important. Yeah. You know, we do it that way. So it's, it's a fun read and it's not, by the way, it's not for helicopter 
people. It's for anyone that going through harsh stuff in his life to get to where he wants to be. And we all have stories to tell, but me, I just wanted to share it. It's a funny story and everything, but it's for anyone uh, that is looking for answers or just have a fun time, you know. I love it. Well, if it's as fun as this conversation has been, then it's going to be a great yeah. book. So I look forward to reading yeah. thank it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Justin. All yeah. right, Fred. Thank you. I hope you, you have a too. great day. Thank you. And anytime we can do another we'll one. You. No worries. Well, I'll have to okay. do it. Yeah, we'll do one live on set one day. We'll talk about when it. The, when the, uh, <laughs> yes, we can always do that. Send me a message because I've, I, I forget. So yeah. Send me a message on Instagram. Hey, Fred, don't forget if you can, because I can always take you on set. Um, and then you'll become part of my team really because that's the only way I can get you on set. And then you'll become part of our team and then you can uh, work with us for a day or two and then, uh, and then you get paid. <laughs> let's do it. Yeah. Let's make it happen, yeah. man. That'd be yeah. great. Well, have a great day. Uh, I wish you all the best. Like I said, I'm gonna go buy the book. So have a yeah. good one. Thank you so much, Justin. Take care. Bye.